Greetings. Regarding last week's, uh, frankly, um, I didn't realize <laughs> that people listening on iTunes in international countries might not get the uh, metacognition attempt I had with those bleeps. So I will never do that again. Uh, that was an N equals one experiment. Uh, this week, I would uh, like to do a reflection on a Lord of the Rings theme. Uh, if, like me, um, you're in your 50s or 40s or 60s uh, or younger or older, uh, the Lord of the Rings four books, along with The Hobbit, um, might have had an influence on uh, your upbringing, um, not from a moral philosophical standpoint, but it was an escape, uh, the, another world um, with morals and good guys and bad guys and epic stakes. Uh, in many ways, it was prescient um, in a uh, allegory for our modern society. There were many archetypes uh, in the Lord of the Rings. Um, Gandalf was the leader, Aragorn uh, and Frodo were the hero, um, Legolas was the warrior, Gimli was the industrialist, um, and, and such. Uh, so today, what I'd like to talk is about the various archetypes in modern society and how these archetypes are probably not suited for the archetypes we're going to need in the future. And what does the fellowship of the ring, metaphorically, um, mean for our culture? What is the fellowship of the ring metacrisis style? Uh, that's what I'd like to uh, riff on today. <laughs> So first of all, our modern archetypes, um, there's lots of them, but uh, um, let's just look at some main ones. There's the banker uh, or investor that uses a optimal foraging theory dynamic as a biological organism coupled with a culture with lots of energy surplus. It is a respected uh, profession. Finance is overlaid on top of energy materials, technology, and ecology. Another is the worker. Uh, around the world, there are billions of nine to five workers that uh, combine with machines and energy to create products. Uh, they don't make a lot of money. In fact, the um, correlation between money supply and income is incredibly correlated to uh, the top 1% uh, and the bottom half um, have basically been flatlined the last few decades. I digress. Uh, the third category uh, of archetype is the technologist. Um, better and better chips and innovation and efficiency and inventions um, have continued widening the straw and uh, propelling growth forward in a naive progress sort of way. Technologist is an archetype. Uh, next, we have the barker. Uh, in a society full of energy surplus near the last uh, stage between the energy, uh, before the energy surplus gets dissipated or consumed in society is the salesman. Uh, and the salesman add on uh, 10 or 15%, uh, which keeps them employed. Um, so we have salesmen or barkers as, as a archetype riding the carbon pulse. The next is the scholar. Uh, and we have academics, scientists, uh, university professors around the world. Uh, next would be the warrior. We have military uh, people in the United States, especially in the United States and, and around the world, uh, young men and women that work for the Air Force, the Army, the Reserves, the Marines, and, and other foreign uh, militaries. We have the preacher, which uh, is not a salesperson per se, but someone who evangelizes ideas, often connected to religion, but not necessarily. We have the consumer, uh, which is those people, especially in the global north, that on the backs of energy surplus have created uh, houses full of 60 or 70 items that need to plug in and have access to electricity, 
short-term stimulation, technology, iPhones, Disneyland trips, sporting events, vacations, etc. The last archetype of modern society is the elite, uh, the one percent uh, of people that are, are living high on the carbon uh, surplus. Um, and their roles in modern society, um, irrespective of what they do, a lot of people still aspire uh, to this archetype of being elite. Except these nine archetypes are what has worked in the past, what our culture has aspired to and accepted and culturally advocated in the past 50, 70 years. We are now approaching either uh, a Mordor economy where AI and the productivity straw widens our um, sucking up of ecosystem services, planetary health, um, or we reach limits of productivity. And as our energy uh, declines, we're going to have the name of this podcast, a great simplification, which is a reduction in energy and material benefits to most people. So where do these archetypes, uh, these current archetypes morph to, lead to under uh, a likely scenario in coming decades? Well, the banker may more to, morph to a hoarder um, where loss aversion uh, keeps those people from being pro-social and, and uh, part of their community and tries to hold on to what they've, uh, um, the excess claims on reality that they've accumulated. The worker in a place where AI is getting um, more prevalent, energy surplus goes uh, away and wealth inequality increases, the worker can become the indentured or even the slave in many places. Uh, Patrick Nodal on a recent podcast told me that, uh, de you know, depending on the definition, we have more slaves today than any time in human history on the planet. Technology. The technologist used innovation in the past generation or two to invent devices that improve the human experience. But with AI and big data and the like, a good part of the technology space may morph into the cyborg, a transhumanist merging of technology and humanity. In short, in an effort to save humanity from ecological and material limits, we may lose our actual humanity. The barker uh, who lives on the energy surplus that uh, powers salespeople going forward may morph into the grifter, uh, someone that doesn't have the ease of having a job as they did in the past and turns to whatever me method they can to make ends meet. The scholar could morph into the farmer as we need a lot more people working on the land and generating real surplus as opposed to a deputy dean for uh, student affairs or some esoteric uh, PhD that's not really contributing to what uh, the future will need. The warrior, uh, will all these military be people instead of fighting other countries be need as an enforcer uh, to keep um, uh, civilians and the peace, um, we recall the, the George Floyd situation, is that going to repeat and, and escalate? The preacher, well, the preacher uh, will always exist as an archetype in, in human cultures, maybe with a, with a lowercase p and a smaller megaphone because they won't have access to their own AM uh, radio station with, with the way the internet works today. The consumer may morph to uh, the addict, um, where we still have access to goods and services and uh, stability, but a lot of the things that gave us our short-term dopamine hits are no longer available. And uh, that could be fine, but for the average person that might have some mental withdrawal symptoms. And lastly, the elite. This morphs into um, a wild card. It could go two different ways. I almost thought of, of saying the loci, which was the Star Trek episode with the half black face and half white face uh, with two different personalities. The elite could go the way of the hoarder and just try and build uh, bunkers around the world and uh, 
uh, live off their historically stored surplus, or the elite could play a huge role um, in a collective uh, response to the great simplification. So these are the, the, the archetypes, just hypothetically how I see them uh, potentially unfolding in coming decades. But what are the archetypes that we need? What are the archetypes, knowing what we do about the system science of our world, uh, what would be the nine archetypes that our future needs? First, the ecologist, someone who understands the interrelationship of things, the interrelationship of humans to nature, to soil, to the biosphere, um, the interrelationship of academic topics and how they explain reality from a fundamental level. The engineer, uh, someone that has the scientific knowledge of building and blueprints and scaffolding and electronics and how to actually look at a system from an engineering perspective in case hard decisions need to be made on, on, in that realm. The ancestor, we're all here as products of our successful ancestors. But what's happened now is all of our ancestors lived on a ecologically empty planet. We don't. And we are ancestors to um, what comes after, not only our species, but other species as well, complex life. We are the ancestors of complex life in coming centuries and millennium. And so almost this replaces the preacher uh, in a way. It's someone that has sapience, has wisdom in addition to cleverness and looks at our impact of being good ancestors to the future. The craftsman, uh, I thought about uh, saying the MacGyver, but some younger people not know, might not know what that is. But someone who can build things with their hand using a variety of materials, perhaps not with the global supply chains and Home Depot and Walmart access that we have today, uh, but a craftsman. The healer. Right now we have doctors and nurses. I think in the future, the healer is going to be an important uh, archetype. We're going to have to get 80% of the health benefits using 20% of the plastics and overnight resources that we have today. And that's going to require more of a generalist sense um, in medicine, but also a lot more uh, mental, physical, psychological resilience and, and well-being before people are sick, including potentially new food systems. The stalwart. Sam Gamgee was such in The Lord of the Rings. Um, there are people who are, and, and Carl Jung had one of his 12 archetypes, if I recall, was the regular person. Uh, we're going to need an anchor or a ballast or someone that just uh, acts as a, as a rock in the room to um, support others uh, that, that is strong uh, and uh, is just kind of an even keel temperament. The warden or the earth warden, uh, this is going to be someone who understands ecology but stands in defense of the natural world and the other critters we share the planet with. And that this is someone who lives in our communities uh, as an archetype that actually um, prioritizes the health and protection of other species and our local ecosystems and watersheds uh, and prioritizes that over uh, monetary profits. The merrymaker um, also could be jester or artisan or, or musician or something, but we need someone in our society that lifts us into joy with uh, poetry and art and music and dance. Uh, and right now we've got super normal stimuli uh, sort of access, but the merrymaker isn't of the human uh, quality and uh, the way it was in the past. And finally, the matriarch, uh, some bastion of feminine wisdom that's more longer looking, more right brain centered than our current society. We need an archetype for the future um, that is akin to that. So these archetypes of the future 
are not the fellowship I had in mind because there are three timelines of the future. There's right now our current business as usual, uh, which is unsustainable and has uh, a road close sign in the future. There is the distant future, 20, 30, 40 years from now, after we've navigated the bringing the ring to Mordor uh, um, situation, which I'm going to talk about in a second. That's where these nine archetypes reside, uh, is in the future. And we need those people today as well. But this is not what's going to get us through the bender break moment uh, in coming years and, and decade. So there is a third time frame, which is the next decade or so. What are the archetypes that we're going to need in our society to meet this incredibly difficult challenge of respecting our biosphere and having the human economy uh, thrive, uh, but not eat our, our, uh, our home? Uh, so here in no particular order uh, are some archetypes for the bend or break moment. The silver tongue. We have a tribal uh, temperament and we have social media has polarized and splintered all the various demographics in our society. We have so many single issue siloed uh, analyses and we're going to need a, 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 an archetype to um, translate and um, act as a diplomat between these various factions. Otherwise, we have no hope. This is one of the, the um, dearly needed archetypes and at high levels in your community, but also at the UN and uh, in Washington and, and abroad. The alchemist. Um, the alchemist uh, historically combines different chemicals into potions and formulas the alchemist during the bender break moment understands our biophysical balance sheet and knows that we use money and technology as society markers for energy materials and ecosystem impact. And we're going to have a shrinkage uh, on the former versus the latter. And the alchemist is uh, to be fluent in this and to prepare uh, benign pathways for how that shrinkage occurs. The disarmor. Um, I think that I like that word anyways, because uh, we should disarm people with the truth uh, and um, move to a different Overton window sort of conversation. But that's not what I had in mind. We have over 12,000 nuclear warheads. Uh, hardly anyone is focused on what's going on in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, and Israel and Gaza, uh, other than the horrible loss of life. But this uh, undergirds a huge instability in the way the world uh, is in coming decades. And unless we are able to take the non-military path, I don't see how this all doesn't end up in a, in a conflagration. We need serious disarmament uh, techniques. So an archetype there is a peace activist, if there is such a thing. Um, or something more Machiavellian to reduce the risk of bright flashes. The muse, um, we need someone without a specific goal that acts uh, as, a, as an inspiration, as some little turbo boost to other people with warmth and love and music and kindness, and that this is infectious and spreads that dynamic around more people in a time of increasing chaos and despair, uh, the muse is going to be an important archetype. The effectivist. Many trends in social and especially environmental space are getting worse, not better. In addition to the sharing of facts, demonstrations, and social signaling that defines conventional activism, we need effectivists. Those humans who care more about end results rather than the social accolades and make plans and execute the plans accordingly. The barber. We are in a biophysical way playing a giant planet sized uh, game of musical chairs and there are going to be haircuts. There's going to be triage needed and we're going to need people that uh, at local levels, at all levels, 
that prioritize what we spend resources on. And some things are going to be uh, dead ends. And some of our financial uh, chits that represent uh, reality in our minds uh, may not actually ever be called uh, into uh, being spent on reality. And there's a difference between nominal and real reality as far as inflation. So I think um, there are haircuts on the way, especially in the global north. Uh, and to have an expert uh, um, archetype understanding that and prioritizing it is, is something important. The governess could be governor. I chose governess. Um, our ways of making decisions right now um, are not suited for what's ahead. And we need different forms of making good decisions. And I'm not an expert on that, but that archetype is, is deeply needed, the governess. The wellspring for this, this fellowship that I'm uh, describing here, there could be one who acts as just a central node of, of power and energy and enthusiasm and support um, that when the others get beaten down or discouraged or slip up, there's always this pushing, this thread, this unity. Gandalf was kind of this in, in The Lord of the Rings, but it doesn't have to be a, a powerful, charismatic person other than a really strong, uh, deep running ethic uh, of, of a human being. And you know those people in your own community. We need more of them. Last but not least, we need an archetype of the catalyst. If we recall in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo um, was the hero, but even he was unable to take the ring to Mordor. Um, it required Sam and Gollum, uh, who was kind of a tragic monster. Uh, they were catalysts that changed the result of the story. And I think many of you um, may think, what role can I play in, in what's coming? You can be a catalyst. You do your job, live with your family, enjoy your life, learn and pay attention to what's going on. And you never know when your actions could shift the larger story. The most important part of this little frankly reflection, uh, I, I've um, outlined some, you know, playfully some categories of archetypes. When I read The Lord of the Rings, I loved the magic swords and the dragons and the different uh, um, species other than humans. But the really great feeling I had when I was reading it for three hours a night and didn't want to put it down, it was the feeling of camaraderie and fellowship. These nine uh, archetypes I just outlined have to work together and not we can't solve what's coming just solo. There's got to be little groups, little fellowships all around the world. And this is one of human superpowers. It's forming small groups of uh, diverse skills and temperaments and attitudes and bells and whistles and collaborating towards a greater goal. The greater goal is how do we navigate the great simplification without a collapse without a nuclear war and without collapsing the biosphere. This is the largest uh, David and Goliath or uh, uh, I forgot the bard's name versus smog uh, in Lord of the, in, in the Hobbit. Um, but we have to create these fellowships metaphorically on a societal level and perhaps not so metaphorically uh, in your own community and, and watershed. Um, I hope this made sense. And um, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.